Bueno, bienvenidos a todas y todos. En primer lugar, desde el equipo del programa Desarrollo Psicológico y Psicología Evolutiva, darle la bienvenida en principio a los estudiantes de la UCO, que nos vamos a encontrar durante todo el semestre, con el equipo trabajando, desearles bueno, un semestre de muchos aprendizajes. Eh, en segundo lugar, agradecer y darle la bienvenida a los participantes que se encuentran por Zoom en este momento, y especialmente darle una cálida bienvenida y un gran agradecimiento al profesor Balciner por acceder tan amablemente a esta conferencia que para nosotros, como equipo del programa y este, para quienes nos acompañan, es de un altísimo valor. Nuestro equipo del programa está compuesto por los siguientes docentes. El doctor Daniel Camparo, que en este momento se encuentra en otro sitio de la facultad y que va a realizar la traducción de la conferencia. La Magíster Karen Moreira, que lo va a acompañar eh, en el apoyo de la traducción. Y este, docentes que acá estamos presentes, Liliana Suárez, Fiorella Nesta, y quien les habla, Daniela Díaz, que soy la encargada de la unidad curricular. También eh, se encuentra en el programa Sandra Silveira, que no nos puede acompañar, y Virginia Sosa, que se encuentra con licencia. En, realidad, eh, en, en relación a comunicación sobre la organización, que es importante plantear lo siguiente. Quienes están por Zoom podrán elegir escuchar directamente a Balciner en inglés o, se, o seleccionar la traducción en el Zoom. Eh, les comunico cómo hay que hacer para quienes están desde ese lugar. Para elegir el audio en español deben hacer clic en el botón interpretación en el signo del globo. Eh, tienen que hacer clic luego en el idioma que desee escuchar que por supuesto es opcional en el caso que, que quieran escuchar la traducción o directamente al profesor. Y para escuchar solo el idioma interpretado, da clic en silenciar audio original. ¿Sí? Vamos a hacer una pequeña prueba ahora con Daniel, eh, para ver que todo esto salga bien en, en, para los eh, compañeros que nos acompañan por Zoom. Perfecto, también nosotros desde acá, Daniel, escuchando. Otras cuestiones, para que eh, es importante comunicar que no se habilitará micrófono, pero sí el chat en el Zoom por preguntas, y este, para quienes están presentes acá presencialmente en el aula magna, pueden escribir alguna pregunta que quieran hacer el profesor Balciner en, en un papel y hacernos llegar a, a la mesa. Este, la, la idea es que la conferencia esté pensada para una hora y una media hora de intercambio. Aclaramos que no se van a expedir certificados. Y a continuación, y antes de dar comienzo a la conferencia, presentar al profesor Balciner. Ian Balciner es profesor de Psicología Cultural y del Desarrollo en la Universidad de Alborg, Dinamarca. Anteriormente se desempeñó como profesor e investigador en la Universidad Clark de Estados Unidos y en la Fundación Nacional Danesa de Investigación en Dinamarca. Ha sido galardonado con el premio Alexander von Humboldt en 1995 y el premio Hans Killian en 2017 por su trabajo interdisciplinario sobre desarrollo humano. Sus últimos estudios e investigaciones se centran en la psicología cultural y la organización cultural de los procesos cognitivos y afectivos humanos en el ciclo vital. También ha contribuido a los campos de la historia de la psicología, así como a la metodología de la investigación psicológica. Desde ya, muchas gracias a todos y nuevamente darles la bienvenida y expresar nuestra gratitud al profesor Balciner por su tiempo y dedicación para con nosotros. Damos comienzo a la conferencia. Well, so yours, Jan. Yeah, muchas gracias para todos. Thank you everybody for coming to listen to this encounter. I was extremely pleased to be invited to your inauguration ceremony for a number of reasons. The first reason is that I like to talk with young people who are in the beginning of their studies in social sciences and in psychology, who are filled with enthusiasm, eagerness, interests, as well as they feel that they don't know yet. Over many years of my teaching to undergraduate students, in North America, and then followed by all over the world, teaching all over the world, Japan, Australia, uh, Europe, and so on. I have been telling the young students that they are lucky. They are too young 
to be taken seriously. Therefore, they can invent very interesting new ideas and put them into practice. When they become already master students and for heaven's sake, doctoral students somewhere, this luck disappears and they become very carefully directed. Sometimes in English, we say trained. We talk about graduate training in a slightly similar ways as we train animals, although the comparison is somewhat awkward. So being young means also being very resourceful and being ready to undertake very important innovations in a science that has been stagnating for over 100 years. It's a very harsh statement by me to say that psychology has stagnated. Who am I to say that? What is my basis for saying that? My basis for saying that is uh, observation that theoretical innovation in psychology in the last 60, 70 or 80 years has been displaced by endless collection of empirical data. All of you, once you encounter either textbooks of psychology, which very often come from North America, a very limited cultural condition, rather than the center of the universe, or reading empirical articles in existing journals, you wonder what is this all about? And this is a good question. What is psychology doing that is theoretically innovative and practically useful? This is a very open question. When I tell my students about different possibilities to do innovative work, all over the world in the last 20 or so years, I hear a question. Are we allowed to think this way? Are we allowed to use these methods? This question makes me very worried because this indicates that the given area from where the students come is closed for innovation. When people ask questions, are we free to do something? It means they feel not free. Freedom in doing science is extremely important. Maybe one of the most celebrated developmental psychologists of 20th century, Jean Piaget, in his nicely arrogant way, managed to overcome it. As a young biologist who entered into psychology, after studying mollusks in Neuchâtel Lake, he was given the task of administering British intelligence tests to school children in a Parisian suburb. He did it, but he found it deeply uninteresting. Instead, he started to pay attention to not how well the pupils did in the intelligence tests, but how, in which ways, they tried to answer the very fuzzy questions of the intelligence test. He did not ask the question, am I allowed to do things differently? He just did it. The result of it is a so-called Piagetian perspectives, which all of you will study in one form or another in developmental science, developmental psychology. But the starting point for that perspective was one young man's decision to do something differently. So I encourage all of you in the big room and everywhere who listen to today, to do things differently. 
but do them in a thoughtful way where your interests in deep aspects of psychological science, deep aspects of human and social development would lead you to questions that have never been asked in the existing psychological science and that have never been recorded in any textbook you may be encountering in your studies. So in this spirit, I take accept the invitation to be with you today. And I try to elaborate some very complicated ideas in ways which seem to be simple. And at the same time in that simplicity, they have been overlooked. Why have they been overlooked? Well, here comes the starting point of cultural psychology and as well, developmental psychology. Developmental science has had enormous difficulty in finding its place in psychology over the last 150 years. Why? Because the notion of development, which is that of metamorphosis, changed from one state to another, has not been the starting philosophical point of view for the rest of psychology. Over the 20th century, the idea of development had been introduced to psychology a number of times to be back translated into ontological statements of what is, what is there. So any question about human development becomes easily translated into what are human beings like in different stages of their development. Stages of development are important, but they do not answer developmental questions. I will come back to it a little later. In the last 25 years and more, I have been in the center of developing of cultural psychology. We established the journal Culture and Psychology in 1995. And ever since that time, I have been asked, what is cultural psychology? And I have had hard time answering it. Why? Because on the one hand, it is very clear that all human psychology is necessarily cultural. We all live in cultured environments. We create culture to ourselves in very many different forms. On the other hand, if all psychology, human psychology is cultural, why emphasize it? So I talk about cultural psychology. Isn't it as absurd as to talk about watery water? Water that is water, yeah? Watery water. No, it isn't. Cultural psychology in the last 30 years has brought to psychology a number of innovative directions. There are more or less eight or 10 different directions that violate the traditions of traditional psychology of behavioral or cognitive kind and grow beyond them. And interestingly, they grow beyond behavioral and cognitive psychologists in the direction of developmental psychology, in the direction of developmental science. The crucial issue in that is exactly the notion of the very central notion of culture, and this is exactly the notion that cultural psychology is a new development of psychology of experiencing the world by human beings. This is, this is already nicely presented in this slide. And that is exactly the notion of duration, enduring, tolerating, living through, adjusting to, adjusting the world to our needs, inventing something new, that has not happened before, falling in love, falling out of love, having children, loving children who do not give you any sleep and so on and so forth. These are all seemingly paradoxical inventions of human mind, which you do not see in animals, different higher levels of animals, but which are typically human in our lives. 
The crucial feature of cultural psychology is exactly the notion of the sign. The sign stands for something, for something else. The sign is brought into the developmental process, evolutive process in our everyday lives when there is high uncertainty. The uncertainty is overcome by introducing signs. So what would be some examples of using the signs? Almost anything you do in your daily lives, decisions you make and so on, happenings under the conditions of uncertainty. Uncertainty is not comfortable. Uncertainty is cre created by the possibilities that the next moment in our experience may be one way or another. It can be A or B, as you see on the left side of this scheme. Now, how do you deal with this uncertainty? you decide that some of the two or some of the many possibilities of the future have some meaning that is important for you. So you decide totally haphazardly that the particular sign indicates that option A is good rather than option B. That is the right-hand side of this. Now the way of dealing with signs is not so simple. If you have ever read a children's book by Swedish author Astrid Lindgren about a young schoolboy by the name of Rasmus, then Rasmus, like many schoolboys, has enormous difficulty in the morning. He has to decide whether to go to school or not go to school. So in order to decide, he wants to give both chances an equal opportunity to go to school, to not go to school. So he tosses a coin, he throws a coin and sets up the rules by which he decides to go to school or not. He's, if his the rules are the following, if the coin lands this way, he will not go to school. If the coin lands this way, he will also not go to school. But if the coin lands on the edge, then he will happily go to school. Now you notice in that childish example, something very important for our ordinary lives. We have our preferences, which we prefer to be better options than other preferences. So we play similar games like Rasmus with different signs that allow us to do something rather than something else. So for example, you go to a very nice coffee shop in Montevideo and you see a beautiful cake. Of course you do not takes a cake right from the coffee shop, like any animal finding of some food would do, you ask whether you could eat the cake. The shop assistant says, of course, but you yourself think, I am on a diet. I should not eat that cake. This is a sign regulation. I am regulating my own self to discipline myself not to eat the cake that seems very delicious. I think you have all been in similar situations. How do you solve it? Well, you can just forget it all and go on, not trying the cake. Or you can use the next level of sign that denies the previous level. For example, today is my birthday. I deserve this piece of cake. And you happily continue and eat the cake. So you see that the sign mediation, the sign regulating the particular valuation of different options, like on the right hand of the scheme, 
can become very complicated. They take forms that go very far from cakes and diets. They go to the question of death, life and death of fellow human beings. What is my right as a human being to shoot some other person who my government tells me is my enemy, but I do not need know him? Why should I shoot this person? What is my moral conscience like when I'm asked to shoot an unknown person because somebody says this is my enemy? So these are all deeply human questions that have been wondering us or worrying us over centuries. And they are all organized by the use of science. The use of science is something that traditional psychology does not consider. It, or it comes to it at a certain moment, like in cognitive sciences, where the meaning system or categorization systems are important. But these sciences do not deal with the invention and the function of these particular signs, meanings, in real lifetime. Whereas all of our decisions in real life happen in irreversible time. So the moment of everyday life, the particular act, every particular act in our lives is constantly regulated in our own development by particular signs. This scheme is a little bit more complicated because it puts a particular sign S into the complex of past, where it comes from, and future towards which it is going. Now the separation of past, present, and future is very crucial for any philosophy of irreversible time. And it is absolutely necessary for any perspective that claims to be developmental or evolu evolutive. In the case of cultural psychology of irreversible time, the signs are made up for the functioning in the present. The sign S regulates a particular act, like the example of not eating the cake or eating the cake. But they're all based on previous significados, generalizations, for example, the diet, healthy living, justice, and so on. These are all signs, very general signs, that regulate the ways how we construct particular signs here and now in the act, in the present. Yet the construction of the here and now sign S is always new. It is not simply a selection from existing signs, but it is a specific construction here and now of different sense for myself, the specific field of understanding of myself based on the previous meanings that come to us which are also generalized. After I have organized my life through the sign S in here and now act, it has two functions. One is to regulate the present moment, like in the example of the eating the cake. The other one is create something for the future. We are acting at the present time, making meaning here and now, for the sake of not yet known future time. We go to study something in university, not only because it is interesting here and now, but because it gives us something for the future. The something is never pre-known, is not known in advance, but is expected. The direction may be oriented, but it is not guaranteed to happen. When the next future moment comes, this particular hyper-generalized signs, as I call them, operate as catalytic features 
in the regulation of the future encounters with the world. That is a right-hand side of the scheme. What would be important here to understand? What the phenomenon would be important? All parents are interested in guaranteeing safety for their children in the future. Accidents can happen here and now. Children fall, children encounter sharp objects, they cut their knives themselves and so on. They approach dangerous spaces. They have to cross streets in a, in a city and so on. In all of these situations, the here and now situation is always uncertain. There can be dangers, there can be near accidents, there can be real accidents. From all of this, we do not just make sense meaning out of it for our present moment, but we create hyper-generalized new sign fields that would anticipate the possible dangers of the future. When you say to a child, be careful, it is not clear what I have said. Careful is a very indeterminate, very unclear sign. But the child carrying it for the future, or you remembering your parents telling you one or another message, are exactly the examples of the hypergeneralized sign that you carry forward. So. The hypergeneralized notion is actually new for psychology. Anything in this generalization scheme that you see is up to the notion of generalized axis, abstracted and generalized, is well known in cognitive science. There's nothing new in the lower part of this scheme. We start from specific situations, field of specific particulars, which is fuzzy, which is not clear. We cognitively try to integrate that into some abstracted concept X, which becomes generalized. And then at a certain moment, the generalization becomes overwhelming to our mind. It becomes totally taking over our mind in full. It no longer is verbally expressible. The generalization is expressible, but the high hyper generalized feeling, which is very central for our personal existence, cannot be put into words anymore. It can be translated into generalized concepts. For example, I tell you, I'm a humanist. You say, well, I understand you. No, you don't understand me. Why? Because I am only using the term humanist in based on my hyper-generalized feeling about the world. You are saying, I understand you based on your hyper-generalized meaning of the world humanist. They do need not overlap. They may, but they need not. So in other sense, we are communicating on the level of words, on the level of meanings, but all of this reference, something we have assembled in our life as a higher level of our functioning for our living, which is important for our living. Here is where psychology of religion and psychology of art and psychology of all higher levels of psychological functioning comes to be very central for human development of psychology as well as for cultural psychology. You see that the unity of the two areas comes together exactly in the hypergeneralized side, not in the generalization. So, but what is hypergeneralization? This why is it important? This is a level where one can pass forward from past to future. Some of the relevant experience accumulated in the past. You cannot pass it on at the level of simple generalization. You have to pass it on at the level of your hypergeneralized feeling meaning system that is then translated into new situations in the future. 
That is the value of education. That is what you are doing in the university. That is why you can, if you want, solve new problems, not being fearful of thinking a particular way, but being courageous in thinking in new ways. This is a level where the border between past and future can be passed. In our everyday life, it cannot be passed. It constantly moves on. And we are all, always facing the future that we know only of it becomes past. Here is an example of highly ambiguous case. I selected this because this has very many features of our present day societal life which come to us from the 17th century, from the Italian painter Guido Reni, who painted many of the biblical scenes, including that of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. This is in some sense from our present day, it would be a rape scene. Only the rape scene was a woman is raping the man not the man, the woman, as we are assuming usually in 21st century. But it is not the rape scene. It's a scene of encounter between a man and a woman who are deeply involved in their particular social roles and who are acting accordingly in relation to one another. The woman is a wife of the superior of Yosef. Yosef is a servant of Potiphar. The woman is a wife of Potiphar. Yosef is dedicated to his boss and this cannot see the possibility of entering into adulterous relationship with the wife of the boss. The wife of the boss falls deeply for him and very much wants to establish that relationship. Joseph refuses. Joseph runs away, leaving a part of his clothing in her hands. In revenge, she claims that Joseph has been trying to rape her. Joseph is put into prison. Later on, he becomes released and justice is, rest is restored. But this is an example of very complicated kind. It involves adultery, desired adultery, false accusation based on revenge, Joseph's commitment to his boss, and of course, finally, the justice. These are all hyper-generalized meanings that are regulating the understanding of the particular scene. So if you look at it from the point of, through the meaning system of what I just covered, this picture is extremely complicated. It is deeply human because you see these phenomena, not only 17th century, you see them today. So let us go once more back to the scheme. It tells us something very simple and very relevant about hypergeneralized signs. They are oriented to the future and tell us possibilities of being guided in the future, not being determined, not being predicted for the future, which psychology tries to do. You may read from some behavioral textbooks that psychology is a science of prediction and control of behavior. None of this is possible. Future cannot be predicted and it cannot be controlled. Therefore, this version of psychology as science is not possible. Future can be constructed, oriented towards, prepared for, and that is exactly done by hypergeneralized science. So you see how the very simple scheme of putting a sign in the middle of human relation with the world within irreversible time, not in not time free, but exactly in irreversible time, creates a totally new direction 
for science of psychology, which is developmental, evolutive, oriented towards future, working practically towards future, but not being deterministic, not being predictive, and not being quantitative. These are two gentlemen who are guilty of making our lives in science very difficult. Both of them are Nobel Prize winners. Henri Bergson, who invented or emphasized the idea of irreversible time in 1890s, got Nobel Prize in literature in 1928. And Ilya Brigogen, a physical chemist, who read philosophy of Bergson in 1940s, got his Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 1977 for irreversibility in chemistry. The chemical um, uh, reactions that are irreversible in time. Very slowly after Brigogen, you see some of the ideas from this notion coming to psychology by 1990s under the label of chaos theory sometimes, but never understanding the profound relevance of the notion of irreversible time in psychology. So what does it mean? Irreversible time is necessarily there in context of being. It eliminates constants of our research objects. They are not constant, they occur only once. It's not that they cannot be repeated, they just exist in only one version in time because irreversible time is not repetitive. They only once occur here and now. Your feeling of something that this moment or the moment of, is, is that of this moment. Tomorrow you may feel similarly, but it's not the same. It may be similar, but not the same. Psychology translates a notion of similarity into sameness by eliminating time. Whereas in reality, we are operating with similarity over time, but not sameness. And that is a starting point of any developmental perspective in any science. Well, are there is other sciences that deal with similar limit where empirical phenomena are unique, but general knowledge of the science has to be very general. Of course, if you look into this phenomenon, which is extremely simple, it's a matter entering into the atmosphere of Earth burning in the process, it disappears. Maybe some pieces land and land and earth, but maybe not. You see beautiful shower of uh, this burning phenomena, but they stop existing. The meteorite that arrives, is, you see there, is only a trace. It is not existing. What existed is exactly the meteorite that uh, it created this sign. This is a problem of astrophysics. It is possible in astrophysics to have a generalized theory of meteorites without treating the meteorites as if they are uh, always the same as they are. So that leads to a very important point that the leading developmental scientists of 20th century, James Mark Baldwin, came to in the very end of his life, which is in his autobiography back in, in 1930, he made a comment about the quantitative method. The comment that is not a critique, it is a devastating verdict on how developmental perspective in psychology needs to operate. It has to eliminate the quantitative method for a very simple reason, because it 
reduces the more complex to the simple, the whole to its parts, and the later evolved to early existent, thus denying or eliminating exactly the factor which constituted or revealed what was truly at developmental. Now, this means that developmental science, including cultural psychology and developmental psychology in different forms, is different from the rest of psychology. It is different not because it is there's a different label, but because it deals with exactly those aspects of the phenomena that the rest of psychology does not deal. And here you see a very old scheme of mine developed in 1990, I believe, which emphasizes where the problem is. The problem is in between states A and state B. And it is similar to educational sciences, educational practices, clinical practices as well, and basic study of development. Simply documenting a sequence, state A becoming state B, state C, state D, and so on, does not open the door to understand development. Development happens exactly in between, in the transition state, which where state A is no longer there, and state B is not yet there. From the educational point of view, with a goal of guiding your pupils, children and adults to state B, you want to find the roots of state B in the confusion in between A and B. Once B has been achieved, there is no development recordable anymore. The development has already happened. Once A is there and B is not yet visible, we do not know. We know only when we come to the middle. This is a perennial problem which Baldwin emphasized that has been part of the work of Lev Vygotsky, who is emphasized in our present day very much with the notion of zone of proximal development. But the problem remains. The problem remains unsolved. And it is my hope that some of you will find this problem intellectually interesting and maybe practically also of use. So my final point of today's presentation is exactly that. That is a story of cultural psychology as development of human psychology leads us to serious need to deal with theoretical issues before we rush to collect the data. In fact, the data must follow the theoretical questions addressed. Data are very, very difficult to find because you need the kind of data that answer questions that you have raised. So I wish you all good judgment and good ways to develop your own questions and finding your own answers. Thank you for your attention. So I think I should stop the sharing now. And I'm very eager to answer questions. Eh, para quienes estamos acá en el aula magna, si desean realizar alguna pregunta al profesor, por favor, si las puede, pueden anotarla y la hacen llegar a, a la mesa, ¿sí? Y eh, para quienes están en el Zoom, por vía chat del Zoom, pueden hacer llegar preguntas también. Eh, nos damos un minutito, Daniel, para, para recabar las preguntas, si ¿sí están.
Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Daniel, tengo una pregunta por acá. So, um, Professor Daniela is at the room and she will gather the, the questions. Uh -huh. and, and we can have some questions at the, at the chat also. Mm -hmm. So I will translate you to English so you can answer. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Daniel, tengo una pregunta del público por acá. Bueno, eh, una compañera que se encuentra acá presente realiza las siguientes preguntas, por acá me está llegando otra también. ¿En qué medida la polarización política enlentece la innovación? La innovación científica, asumo que hace referencia. La innovación. Est ¿Esta polarización crea una dicotomía en los desarrollos culturales? ¿Quieres que te repita Daniel o...? Ok. Bueno, well, yeah, so the yeah. first question is um, if uh, well, uh, political polarization can um, like harm the innovation if uh, this political polarization creates like dichotomies on the developments, cultural development? Yeah, very good question. We see all over the world in our present day how this is happening. Differentiation is always there, but polarization leads to the dismissal of any dialogue between the polarized parts. So basically, we arrive at the notion of intellectual war, not intellectual exchange. We arrive at an intellectual fight, not an intellectual improvement for differences. So polarization is a very dangerous societal event for any innovation. I can see that very clearly from my own background. When I grew up intellectually and also physically under the conditions of Soviet Union, where we have yeah, to be very careful. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. I was translating, but they were not listening. I will try to resume all the things you said. That okay, you yeah, know, I will continue then I will... that. Yeah. Okay, no. So my, my comment was that when I grew up in the Soviet Union and got my education in the Soviet Union, we experienced the results of this polarization at the time, ideological polarization, very directly and developed immunity to it in the form of not taking it seriously. When I arrived in the United States, I was very much surprised how trustful American students would be of political system. It's a very dangerous moment because this means that the political system can introduce polarities that are not there before and people would accept that. 
uh, there is an important statement that French philosopher Gaston Bachelard made in 1938. He was telling opinions are dead thoughts. Opinions do not think. That means that before people start explain, expressing opinions, this opinion, that opinion, opposite opinions, so already the dialogue is not possible. Dialogue is possible before the opinions are formed, when the different possibilities are negotiated, are shared, are, di are in introduced to each other. Then we can have a dialogue. We cannot have a dialogue when the opinions are formed. We cannot have the dialogue when one social power says, you must have this opinion or otherwise we do something to you. So these are all moments of polaris political polarization that you see all the time all over the world. Bien, Daniel, eh, por acá hay otras preguntas. Tenemos dos preguntas más que están vinculadas en realidad por son de la misma persona. ¿Te las, las planteo? ¿Cuál es la diferencia entre signo y símbolo en su concepción? ¿Y cuál es la similitud entre la idea de semiósfera de Lotman y la psicología cultural? y la psicología cultural. So, what is the similarity difference between Lotman and Lotman's notion of symbol and mind, sign? In, in psycho, uh, cultural psychology and also the difference between sign and symbol. Uh, Lotman semiotics comes from a different source than mind. Lotman builds on Saussure, I build on Peirce. So they come together exactly in the semiotic side of looking at the unit of the semiosphere, but they come together from different sides. Lotman does not emphasize irreversible time. I do. That's why Lotman's ideas fit into my scheme, but my, scheme, my ideas do not fit well into Lotman's scheme. Okay. And regarding yeah. the difference between sign and symbol, if you have, uh, if you have thought about any difference? Well, following or coming out of Peirce, of course, I would make the distinction sign and symbol. Symbol is a specific form of sign, but this is not important. What is important is a notion that any sign can become generalized and hyper-generalized. That is important. Uh, I am quite little interested in trying to narrowly define different forms of science. My, my focus is clearly on the sign relating to the particular event. Perfecto. Um, sí. Okay, now we have another question. Yeah. Yeah. 
language isn't language a form of given stability and to stop time or detain time it is paradox is a paradox because science uh, persevere enduring their time um, although they change how to work in this tension the tension is there of course every meaning in language gives rise to multiple uh, fields of senses and this is not a homogeneous field it is a heterogeneous field with many mutual oppositions how to work with them leads us back to very interesting and abandoned aspect of dialectical philosophy and that is a notion of double negation the notion of double negation was brought into dialectical philosophy by Fichte rather than uh, Hegel and it involves a very interesting implication for us in psychology consider the most usual topic that psychologists study which is gender difference When psychologists don't know what to study, they compare men and women. What does that comparison tell us? It tells us that in some aspects, men are women from, and different from women, and in other aspects, women are different from men. What is the importance of that finding for understanding gender? Unclear. says finding out that men are different from women on this and women are different from men on that is basically negating the fact that men and women are similar they are different empirical finding but now what is the value of this we live together in societies in families men and women live together so the difference is not important rather the overcoming of the difference is important so the second negation in philosophical dialectical sense is a statement yes men and women are different but the difference doesn't matter we negate the difference we do we accept the difference is there we're not saying it's not there it's there but we say it doesn't matter it doesn't matter in what sense it doesn't matter in the sense that different people can come together to join into one family, society, and so on. So that is a direction to take from the inevitable opposition of words fixating something and at the same time denying that fixation. Daniel, desde el chat, tengo una pregunta. ¿Podría pensarse desde el concepto de hipergeneralización que el entendimiento entre seres humanos se daría gracias a, las, a la desgeneralización de los signos? Ok. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Uh, could we think from the concept of hypergeneralization that the understanding between human beings uh, is related to the ungeneralization of science, this, re this re generalization of science? On generalization, or on, yeah, in the sense of in the sense of disappearance of science, in the sense of disappearance of words. Yes, of course, we understand each other through some word exchange, but mostly through the hypergeneralized intuition that we develop. That is what happens when young couples go out together to share the world. They do not talk too much they feel too much into each other 
the notion of feeling into the other, the notion of feeling into the world, which Theodor Lips introduced in German aesthetics and psychology in late 19th century, is a center for our human communication. This has interesting implications. Our de deepest communication between people is silent communication. Sharing something in deep silence, intuitive understanding of one another, intuitive understanding of the feelings of the other. Words can very often be dangerous. You will see that every moment when some of your friends have lost a dear one and you have to invent words to console the other person. You find it very difficult to find words that would fit your feelings of compassion with the other person. And that is an example of communication based on hypergeneralized feelings. So we are working in our everyday lives to develop human relationships on the basis of chatting, talking, and so on, which go beyond the talking. Can we trust the other person? Can I trust this other person? Can I trust the words of the other person? Or can I trust the silence? of the other person. That is really the contrast. I can trust a certain silence, but I do not need to trust the words. Bárbaro, tengo dos más, Daniel. Eh, ¿En qué medida la educación tiene impacto en esa transición? Asumo que refiere la transición entre estado A y estado B. Me parece que es lo, de lo último que, que habló el profesor y, y no aclara más, pero eh, bueno, asumo que tiene que ver con, con eso, ¿no? Sí, perfecto. Tengo una más y nada más, Daniel. Me llega otra por acá en papel, pero no sé si andamos, cómo andamos de tiempo. Bien, yo tengo una, pre una pregunta presencial acá, Daniel, que no sé si, que recién me llegó, pero no sé si, si nos daría el tiempo. Creo, creo que sí, que, que se... Bueno, estaría esa entonces que te dije, ¿no? ¿Verdad? De la anterior. Y eh, me llega de, de un compañero de, o compañera de, del grupo acá. ¿Cuándo un signo es considerado hipergeneral y qué le otorga esa categoría? So we are, as we are approaching at the end of our uh, meeting, I will uh, uh, propose the, the, the following. We have two questions from the room, and then we have some um, questions from the, um, the chat. Mm -hmm. I, pro I propose you to, to, to join them uh, at two, two moments. First, the, the two questions from the room, and next, the, the questions are in English, so you can read them. Okay. Oh. I have to open the chat. I will begin with the questions from the room, if you... If you yeah, sure. It's okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there are simple questions. One is, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the, the, the incidence of education in the transition between state A and state B. And also, uh, when 
the a sign is hypergeneralized and what uh, provides it with this uh, categorization with this feature um the second question i don't know what provides it i i simply i assume that the hypergeneralization is a natural growth process it's a process into vertical dimension of meaning construction okay uh, what forces it uh, I, I cannot say we can elaborate what blocks it for example that would be more interesting to look at it by restrictions on it what would make hypergeneralization suppressed what would make it impossible to develop uh, well an interesting possibility here is uh, overloading of the personal meaning system with very many immediate decision makings, not allowing to philosophize, so to say. And you can think of it in terms of educational practices, where each and every moment of a developing pupil's everyday life is organized by some activity. And there is no way to arrive at hypergeneralized feeling into the world. Uh, yeah, that is one possibility. Yeah. Our hypergeneralization is a thing to avoid for humankind. No, they cannot be avoided at all because they are emerging. Uh, like they can be no suppressed, but not really. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see other English ones here. Wait a second, maybe I'm uh, too far. There's another one, cultural psychology can contribute to solving the problem of weird psychology. Weird psychology, yeah, of course, of course. The weird notion as I talk about weird psychology is now becoming publicly addressed. But you overcome it by locating humanly relevant places where psychological decisions are being made by ordinary human beings. So not by having more subjects from India with a cross-cultural psychology comparisons, but by looking carefully into specific psychological phenomena, unique phenomena, somewhere in places which are very rare or very unusual. Uh, at certain moment recently with my students, I have been discussing the relevance of maximum mastery, studying moments of maximum mastery. That means studying people who have already developed very high mastery skills in some area, who have been motivated to master something over many long times of exercise. These will be top level athletes. These will be musicians. These will be opera singers. The memory of whose is by far above our usual level. How is it possible? How can they live with this way? So these would be examples of where cultural psychology can find its empirical subject matter. Uh, how, what about the phenomenological model? Well, all of our human psychology is necessarily starting from complex phenomena. In this sense, a phenomenological model of Peirce or anybody else will, of course, be better than any non-phenomenological model. The question is, 
how is that model built up theoretically? Yes, we need hypergeneralized science to understand the world. Or to be reversed, it's the other way around. If we do not lead to hypergeneralized world, we will live in a cognitive economy, but not understanding. Excuse me, Jan, as we are finishing our time, uh, I would like you to ask to make a final remark so we can close the, the our meeting. Yeah, thank you, Sandra, for a nice comment. Uh, I, we will discuss it in Brasilia when I come there. Muchas gracias, Sandra, que es una compañera de Brasil, que van a, van a discutir en el futuro que él va a hacer una visita. So thank you everybody. It was very pleasant for me Muchas to get a the comments, the questions. And uh, I wish all of you very nice continuation of your efforts. Saludamos desde el aula magna entonces al profesor Balciner, agradecer a los estudiantes de la unidad curricular. Nos encontramos esta semana y así hasta fin de, de año y bueno y esperar al, al, al profesor Valciner cuando quiera estar por estos lares que será muy bien bienvenido muchas gracias cerramos la conferencia Gracias a todos quienes están presencial y quienes están virtual y nos acompaña por Zoom. Un gran abrazo al profesor Balciner. Gracias, Daniel, por la comunicación. Muchas gracias para todos. Gracias.